Good evening, everyone. My name is Amy Sass, Artistic Director of Ragged Wing Ensemble and host of Moment to Moment. For those of you joining us for the first time, Moment to Moment is a live talk series exploring what can be learned, felt, and created during this time of great transformation. This program is produced by Ragged Wing Ensemble, which is a small but mighty theater and arts organization. It was born out of a need to connect, to spark dialogue, and to do what humans have always done since ancient times, share stories. By sharing stories, we hope to evolve humanity. So to officially begin, I invite you to, in to join me in a simple meditation. This is uh, something that I like to use in order to kind of get us in this uh, digital space to sort of slow down, mainly because we often are using digital spaces to speed up and to produce really quickly. Um, so we are, we are about to kind of enter into a zone that we're gonna create together that is more about slowing down and connecting to this moment and uh, hopefully to open the space for creativity and depth. I like to think of this as an invocation. It's a little meditation um, and I, I call it the arrival. So, so just to find, find a comfortable position to be in. And uh, I'm gonna say some words, I'm gonna light a candle and then we will we'll open our program. We arrive here now in this moment we arrive with awareness knowing that we are attending from different physical locations and different time zones we arrive knowing that no matter where we are we all sit on indigenous land we arrive aware of the need for healing and systemic change we arrive here now into a digital space that some folks have access to and some do not. We arrive with breath, with body, with intention. And I invite you right now to just take this moment to feel the surface that supports your body to become conscious of your breathing. To allow calm to settle into your cells. And to imagine that a larger space is opening up inside your belly, your chest, your throat, your face, just kind of allow the skin on your face to sort of just melt, kind of just relax. A larger vast space, maybe a, a space that blossoms and opens up in the center of your skull just kind of holding that in your imagination. And as you engage in tonight's program, please feel free to give yourself whatever care you need. Um, I think this is a time that we're in where it's so important to, to just take, what, take time to give ourselves care. So whatever it is you need, please feel free to do so. Tonight's topic is police accountability and de-escalation and I have some wonderful guests to talk about a new program tonight. Uh, my guests are our beloved board member and Oakland native, longtime community activist Kathy Leonard, as well as organizer Ann Jenks, both of whom are working for CPA, which is the Coalition for Police Accountability, on a new pilot program called macro. We're going to hear about that. And um, Kathy and uh, Anne, before we completely get started, I thought I'd just read this um, 
just read this little blurb from the macro report to kind of just contextualize and then we'll, we'll get mm -hmm. started. So the little blurb that I want to read is, um, is, is, is from a report that Kathy sent me uh, last week and uh, I thought it was important to sort of just set some foundation. The international outcry over the murder of George Floyd highlights the level of distrust and problems that occur when police interact with black and brown communities. And I wanna just start with that. And Kathy and Anne, if you could just, um, if we can start with sort of identifying the problem that, that macro is trying to solve and kind of take us through the picture of the problem um, and the various layers to it so that we can understand a little bit about that. So um, usually, the police respond to all calls that come in. Calls already low priority. We're dealing with our homeless population, our black and brown population, um, and people that have mental health crises. Mm -hmm. And they deal with every one of those populations the same way, with violence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the macro program removes the police officer from those type of calls, the, low, the um, low priority calls and the mental health calls and the calls that the homeless make or someone is making um, about a homeless person and um, brings in community responders who respond to those calls. Mm -hmm. um, they don't deal with the, the police will not accompany those calls. Mm -hmm. um, there's more harm reduction. There's more in getting services to the people who need those services instead of the um, response always being one geared toward violence. And I think Ann can elaborate a little more on that. Yeah. Um, so uh, back in February of 2019, uh, the Oakland Police Commission held a hearing on policing in the unhoused communities and about 45 unhoused people came and gave very powerful testimony about their interactions with the police, which were overwhelmingly and almost uniformly not good. Um, and what they, the, what they were saying is that, um, first of all, the, the unhoused community has a disproportionate number of people who are formerly incarcerated and may still be on probation or parole. And for them having any interaction with the police potentially puts them in a situation where they get violated and sent back uh, into, into incarceration. Um, a homeless person who has a, has, a, has a problematic interaction with the police for any reason and gets arrested, um, where it's interesting because the police will say, oh, but it's okay because we never even charged them, as if it's okay to arrest people so long as there's no charge that happens later on. For a homeless person to get arrested on these low-level calls, they lose their tent. They also lose their spot in the encampment, right? Somebody else comes in. If it's a, if it's a good encampment and it's a, it's a secure area, they no longer have the spot even if they are able to get another tent. They lose ID. They lose paperwork if they're trying to get through the bureaucracy to get some kind of service or to get into housing or anything else. It just throws uh, an already very challenging situation much further back than it even was before. Um, and you know, even if an officer is responding in the best possible way to a call, there's there's an implicit threat and when you show up with a uniform, everybody knows that you've got the capacity to arrest the person. Um, I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things in the videos that we all see constantly is watching somebody who's being abused and who's still trying so hard to be respectful. You know, I mean, we have such a relationship with police that even as they're abusing you, you're still saying, sir, and please. And, you know, mm -hmm. so someone shows up in a uniform and they have a gun and they have a badge and everything kind of flows from there, right? Um, so in Eugene, Oregon, they have a program that they've had for about 30 years where uh, a counselor and an, and an EMT show up and everybody in the community knows that these are people who do not have any authority to detain you 
They do not have any authority to arrest you. They don't work with the police. They don't report back to the police. They're just going to engage with you and trust that you are the person most knowledgeable about your own life. And they will help you figure out resources if that's appropriate, but they'll come help you figure out a solution to whatever it is that precipitated the call in the first place. I just want to share something that happened that was very shocking a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. There was a homeless guy in my neighborhood, maybe about 15 blocks from my home in North Oakland. It turns out he was a guy that was mentally ill. He was lying in between two homes, not bothering anyone, but someone made a call. Mm -hmm. The Oakland Police Department and said, hey, there's a guy here. He's laying here. Can you come out? So the police came out. They tried to rouse this fellow from some distance away from where he was. Wake up, get up. For 45 minutes, this went on. They, they brought out a bear cat, which is, if you've ever seen one, it's a militarized vehicle. When the guy arose, he did have a gun nearby and they immediately unloaded rifles on him. They used the bear cat as a stage to shoot this poor guy and to murder him. He hadn't done anything, he was sleeping. So these are the type of instances that we're trying to avoid by bringing macro on board. And I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, the city council voted unanimously to fund macro, a pilot program for macro. Um, hopefully, which will go into effect this year. And we did put a link in the chat to the macro report, which was, um, prepared by urban, the Urban Strategies Council, and um, yeah. So those are the, the type of situations that we, we're trying to avoid. Um, so this, this is all about harm reduction, mm -hmm. right? This is all about coming up with, um, this is all about coming up with the alternative methods of handling non-criminal calls. Uh, and, yeah, and low, I mean, low level criminal, I mean, technically, um, public urination and please let me know if there's anybody on this call that has never violated that particular law. Um, it's a criminal hey. call. <laughs> really? <laughs> you must have a very strong bladder. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's technically a criminal call. So when we say, if you say non-criminal, mm -hmm. that's a little bit uh, too heavy of a filter. Sure. The question is, is it a call that you really, there's, you can imagine wanting to arrest somebody as a result of. Uh-huh. Right. So it, it's, it, it sounds like it's, it's calls related to sort of um, mental health issues or nuisance calls. Am I, am I correct on, on that? It's, it's, oh, it's, so it's anything, it's anything that you don't believe needs to be responded to with a badge and a gun. So over time, I would hope that we get to a point where, you know, uh, if somebody calls because there are 12-year-old uh, boys, usually it is the boys, I have boys, um, who are, you know, doing something mildly destructive in the neighborhood, um, we don't really want to arrest anybody in that situation either. I mean, hopefully we can get to a point where we're filtering things more thoughtfully, but it's a lot of the low-level calls. It's a lot of um, a lot of them will end up being calls having to do with the unhoused population, um, whether they're making the calls or because um, they, because people are making calls upon them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I was wondering if the two of you could talk a little bit about just to help continue to orient folks to, to this, to this topic. Um, mm -hmm. Just if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between um, the Department of Violence Prevention like these violence interruption programs, with I think, which I think is our, our sort of newish programming. Um, not sure if that's true or not. Uh, you can kind of correct me on that. And then what is what is CPA and and the relationship between these two, the you know the the DVP, the Department of Violence Prevention, and CPA, and then and then obviously the macro, yeah. So uh, I'll tell you about DVP and Kathy's okay. on the steering committee for CPA, so she can do that. Right. Um, so the Department of Violence Prevention is a, is a very new department. Mm -hmm. um, we were very lucky in that um, the person who agreed to head it is uh, a guy named Garen Los Cespedes. Mm -hmm. 
And um, he has a very long resume having to do with violence prevention, really internationally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what is especially beneficial for us, MACRO, which you know is this is going to be this non-police response pilot, was put into the B Department of Violence Prevention. And the other thing that's very clear from his resume is he has a lot of experience um, overseeing programs, overseeing new initiatives. You know, so, I mean, there's a certain amount of just getting it to happen in the right way. Mm -hmm. And we think that DVP is going to be an excellent place for that piece of it. Um, some of the other programs that are within DVP are this violence interrupter, various ways of uh, uh, to addressing violence in, in the broadest definition of it in some of the heavily impacted communities in Oakland. And one of the things that uh, Chief Cespedes is particularly interested in is in uh, uh, layering programs in the same area. So you don't have siloing where somebody says, well, I just, just do here, but I don't know what else is going on and we don't work with other programs that are addressing other issues. Um, so the macro, the pilot will be um, within the Department of Violence Prevention. It will probably be contracted out just in terms of the running of it to one of the nonprofits that does work that is very similar without the 911 aspect, you know, but is, is working in the same neighborhoods and is working kind of with outreach and, and, and things like that. Great. Thank you. And for, for those joining, so MACRO is Mobile Assistance Community Responders of Oakland. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what the acronym stands for. So Kathy, do you want to tell us about CPA? Sure. So um, CPA is the Coalition for Police Accountability. Um, I'm on the steering committee. And basically their mission is to advocate for accountability of the Oakland Police Department to the community so that the department operates with equitable, just, mm -hmm. constitutional, transparent policies and practices that re reflect the values of Oakland. Mm -hmm. So in furtherance of that mission, we um, write policy. We monitor the implementation of Measure LL, which our predecessor campaign, Yes on Measure LL, as you know, passed by 83% of the vote. So the, the, um, that measure put um, the police commission in place, a civilian-based police, uh, uh, police commission, which is able to write policy for the Oakland Police Department. They took it out of the hands of Oakland Police Department because, of course, their policies were a little problematic with respect to Oaklanders. So they now have the last word um, after the council people do because they vote on it. But basically, they write policy. So our role with that is to help write policy. The commissioners are um, volunteers. They all have full-time jobs. Um, and a lot of us at the, at the, um, on the commission actually help to write policy. Um, we're writing policy right now to fix the, um, some of the things in Measure L that um, it was kind of watered down the first time around in 2016. So we're trying to strengthen the police commission so that they can do their job. Um, and so that should probably be on the November ballot. So look out for fixes to measure LL. So that's basically what we do. Um, it's a multiracial organization. Um, it's comprised of um, individuals, of different community groups, of churches, different organizations are all members. We have 28 member organizations, not including um, individuals. Great. And that's basically what we do. And we're gonna put up a link I think uh, Joshua has put up a link to, uh, yes, he has, to the Coalition uh, for Police Accountability. If you want to learn more about the work that we do, and if you'd like to become a member. Great. And, and I know that in, our, in, in one of our conversations, the conversation we had yesterday, um, there was something came up around, um, one of the things that really struck me was this notion that, you know, not only is it a badge and a gun, you know, right? So uh, police police arrive with a badge and a gun and, and what does that signify mm -hmm. and what kinds of, already the situation is heightened simply because of that visual, right? And the history of that. Um, and, but also the sense that, and I think you were talking about how um, the police 
by and large, probably not every single one, but by and large, they don't live in the communities that they serve. And so that there is a way in which um, there is not this trust that is built, there is not this connection, there is a disconnect simply because they are, they are not, uh, they're not like connected to, to the sort of inner workings of the community and the people who live there. And I, I, and I was hoping you could kind of just talk about that and, and sort of how that, what, what the layers of that, you know, look like, feel like, whatever, yeah. So um, I, I'm not absolutely sure, but I, for some reason, uh, the number of 90% of police officers not living in Oakland is the number that's in my mind. It's a very high number. Um, and uh, it's interesting because we were talking to the police chief the other day about, um, uh, about having community people engaging, you know, basically responding to calls within their own communities. And um, the chief said, this just fascinated me. She said, well, I'd be concerned that they'd be hearing confidential information on the radio about their neighbors. And I thought, well, that's why you like having all of your police not live in the area. They're not hearing about their neighbors. <laughs> I mean, it's very odd to me that she is almost valuing not responding in the community that you live in because it was, so, it was somehow bad, you know? And, and, and the fact is that these are jobs, there are lots of jobs where you have access to some kind of confidential information. When you're responding to emergency calls, you're typically responding to people on one of the bad days of their lives. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and so you get used to that and you, 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 you treat it confidentially and respectfully and, and all of that stuff. And it's part of, it's part of the job. Um, but there's nothing that says somehow it's almost more, you're more valuable if they're not your neighbors because you're not somehow in possession of, of confidential information. Um, we have been, uh, trying to construct, um, a model that removes as many barriers as possible to employment. Um, a lot of people, when they're talking about alternatives for an emergency response, they start immediately talking about um, uh, mental health professionals. And mental health professionals are great, but this isn't actually a job that a mental health professional can necessarily do any better than somebody who is well-trained in de-escalation is well trained, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the types of situations that normally arise, is well trained in understanding what resources and referrals are available and how to help people connect to them, right? But those are the skills. Um, you have to be really good with people. Um, you have to be a good creative problem solver and you have to like the work. And beyond that, you have to be able to read and write because Lord knows there will be paperwork. But um, uh, uh, if we, the problem with mental health professionals, number one is that the responder, it were, the models of an emergency response that rely on licensed clinicians, even if they have the money, they, they, not, they can't expand. So they'll, I mean, we've interviewed them and they've said, we're, we know we get more calls than we can respond to, we can't hire enough people to expand in terms of the hours or the numbers of calls that we're taking, right? And especially in the Bay Area with a high cost of living, you can't hire enough mental health professionals. But also the mental health professionals typically don't look like the communities that they're responding in. Um, and uh, a lot of communities have a, have a, a tense relationship um, you know, social workers are the people who show up and start judging you about whether or not they should take your children. They're not necessarily always allies and they're not necessarily always there to help, right? Just kind of from the community perspective. So we're looking, and, we, and, and the interesting thing is when you start talking to uh, community activists and, and community leaders, and you start saying, these are the types of people that we're looking for, right, to, to do these jobs. Right away, people in the community start saying, well, I know who that is in my community, right? These folks already exist and they already um, 
they already largely have the skill set. Of course, you know, you make sure that, that they're well trained for, for, for the work, but there's absolutely no reason that these jobs can't be done by people who reflect the community, who understand the community and who come from the community. And then the flip side of that is if you're creating jobs that are, you know, by and for the community, then we also need to make sure that they're good jobs. Um, we are gonna save money because instead of having police or fire responding to calls that there's just no reason for them to respond to, we'll save money anyway, but we need to make sure we're not saving money on the backs of the people who are doing the work. There's also a level of trust too. I mean, you, you spoke about the um, high number of police officers that live outside of Oakland. And that is true, it is a very high number. Um, and they normally don't come in contact with the population of Oakland or people like the population of Oakland until they come to Oakland. And then they go back to the suburbs, which are not, not, re not reflective of or have the issues that an urban city would have. So there is a level of trust. Um, the Oakland Police Department has a huge trust problem with our community. Um, the Black Panthers were founded in Oakland because of the, the abuse that um, the Black community suffered at the hands of Oakland Police Department. They would come into Black communities and essentially brutalize them. And it, enough was enough. And so that's why they were founded. So to this day, you know, that wasn't that long ago in the 1960s. Um, I was a child then, I remember that. Don't reveal my age, but. Um, so um, we still have that issue with trust with the Oakland Police Department. And that goes to just about every other police department. So we need to have people in these jobs um, that people have a level of trust with, they feel comfortable talking to, they feel that the person the clinician who goes out there, or the EMT that goes out there is someone who will understand them and understand where they've been and where they're going. Um, and won't look at them with judgment. And then like you said, Anne, the major thing too is there's nothing worse than someone saying they're gonna take your children and you didn't commit any real crime other than maybe you were homeless. Um, maybe you jaywalked across the street and they're gonna remove your children. Um, that's terrifying. And so you really need community people to get in there um, and provide these services. We don't need the police department doing it. Um, well, I, mean, I think that with macro, you'll have a calming influence on whoever it is that they encounter on the street. One example I'd like to give you is, I work in downtown Oakland, I volunteer in downtown Oakland. I'm on the board of the flight deck and Ragged Wing Ensemble. So I'm down here pretty much every day. Um, before COVID, you know, there's a lot of people who are homeless in downtown Oakland. And I would watch the interactions of the police when they dealt with the homeless population and the ambassadors that are hired by the, um, I think it's the, the, the bid in downtown Oakland, the downtown central, I can't remember what they're called, but in any event, there's a bid here that hires people of color, mostly black people, men and women, who, who keep a level of calmness in downtown. They keep the streets clean. If a homeless person or a person with mental health issues has an episode, you should see the way they're able to bring that person down to a level of calmness and get some help for them. And I've seen the police called out. This would just take one or two people to do this. And I've seen the police come out and call 10 officers to deal with one person. And they always have their hands on their gun or their hazer. So that's, that's escalating the issue far beyond where it should have been done. The ambassadors are walking around with no weapons whatsoever. They're using the calmness of their voices. And they're, um, they never have, I've never seen them call the police. And so this is why we need to pull the police back and get community people out here working with people um, who really need help and don't need the strong arm of the law. I want, I want to thank you, Kathy, and, and uh, helping paint like a, a really clear picture of, of the situation and, and what, is, what is happening now and what is possible through this program. I, I want to read this, just a, it's a little blip that I took from, again, from the report that you sent me, mm -hmm. which I just, I love the language here. And I think it, um, 
it's in regard to the the cahoots program in eugene oregon that that and that you mentioned which which for those who who are um coming into this conversation you know this topic for the first time kind of like i am really um the cahoots program in eugene oregon is like the inspirational model for for what is being is being proposed and, and the pilot program of macro that's going to be um tried out in oakland so um this language, I just loved it, which was basically serving people by putting the client at the center rather than criminalizing the client, right? And then also, uh, this is a phrase, dignity and an unconditional positive regard free from judgment and discrimination. And this notion of just the unconditional positive regard mm -hmm just that little section alone, I just was like, wow, like that is a complete, that feels like a big shift. That feels like a totally different kind of way to um, address issues that arise. Uh, and I'm still kind of receiving the, the words unconditional positive regard, because I think that, you know, when we talk about de-escalation, when we talk about um, serving, like what, what does that actually look like, right? Um, and I just thought, you know, as, as we continue, and I know that there's some questions that folks are um, excited to, to, to ask and we'll get to that in a moment, but I, I was hoping that um, either Anne or Kathy could just talk a little bit about, about those ideas and how those, you know, how, how that will be in, in the macro program. Um, so, uh, uh, um, the somebody asked about training mm -hmm. and um, because we're trying to create a brand new program we we do intend to like get some cahoots folks down to help us mm -hmm. with things like the initial training and and hopefully even to ride along initially because we're gonna send out a van with people who have not done this particular thing before even if they've done other outreach or you know done mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 um, uh, any of the outreaches that, that, that already exist. Um, so they'll be well-trained in terms of the de-escalation. And then it's about kind of the, um, the, uh, the culture that you create, mm -hmm. right? One of the things that I really like about Cahoots is they are constantly talking about the difficult calls and what they did well and how are we going to handle this next time. Um, and they, somebody was just telling me the other day that they had a long discussion uh, about whether people want to give them guns. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's great. You should take any gun that anybody wants to give you, right? Let's just get them off the streets. And they were like, yeah, we didn't, we had a long discussion about it. We weren't comfortable taking guns. We don't, uh, da, 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 da. and then we decided we're going to take ammunition. Um, now, I still hope that macro team comes to a different conclusion because I just want them to take any gun they can get off the street, off the street. But, the, you know, they're just very thoughtful. And when something new comes up, they all talk about it. And if they have a difficult call, they discuss the call. They have an ethic where if you're concerned about how your coworker is engaging, you tap them out. And if you're tapped out, you step away. There's no discussion about whether you ought to be tapped out or not. And the main reason people get tapped out is that they're getting too enmeshed in the situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's not like I'm tapping you out because you're being rude. It tends to be because you're, yeah, you're a little too engaged at this point. We, we you know, you got to keep your distance. Um, so they're, they're just very thoughtful about it. And that's part of, you know, the culture that, that they've created. Is to, is to do that. One of the pieces of macro and of cahoots is um, in terms of helping people get to referrals or resources that they need, they'll give people a ride. I mean, if the, if the solution that we're discussing is that, you know, yes, you do want to go to rehab, um, but you haven't been able to get into a program and we know the programs that are available then macro can say, you know what, they're open right now. Let's at least get you registered. And then we'll see where it goes from there. And they'll just take them in the van and, and they'll do what's called a warm handoff. 
to really facilitate people getting access to the services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and just, uh, you know, lastly, before we open up to the, to the whole group, my understanding, and, and this, was, this helped me, helped frame it for me when we were talking yesterday, is that, you know, we have the visual of the, the officer with the badge and the gun, right? And that the visual for this is vastly different Right, I guess in, in, in Eugene, Oregon, it's a specific van that people recognize. Um, I'm not sure if there's a particular outfit that folks are wearing, but it, it looks very different. It does mm -hmm. not look um, mm -hmm. all the, it doesn't ha have the sort of visual cues of, of punishment, essentially. It has like, it has a different kind of visual cue. So um, let's, Let's open this up to, to folks to be able to ask questions. I know that there are some in the chat um, and folks can also just uh, speak up and ask as well. Great, you're all uh, able to unmute now. Ellen, for, since you had asked the question first, did you get your, the answer that you were looking for about training or do you want to well, ask a further there, question? There are, two, yeah, there are two kinds of training. One is the assessment of the telephone. You know, who, who's getting those calls? Um, I'm assuming that some of them come to 911 and they need to be sent to macro, maybe macro is really crucial about how do you know when you should be going to that place. And then what you're talking about is really initial assessment, but then support and ongoing help as people work in the field. In my experience, I've done some work in this field, is that there's a little bit of money, but not much for training and ongoing support and, and a program is obviously Eugene understands that and I'd be really interested about the funding related to training as well as reasonable salaries and everything else. So that was a concern of mine. So um, initially we'll, the, the macro will be responding to 911 calls and to calls into the police non-emergency line. Okay, um, all calls all all calls initially go to the police, and then if they if they believe that there's a fire or a chemical spill or a medical issue, then they're sent from the police to to fire. And we've also talked to the fire department, and they have some interest in particular types of calls that they really think would be better done by macro, as well. So the dispatchers get a lot of training, um, and um, it's been interesting to talk to dispatchers as well because they have opinions about what calls they very much like. I mean, they hear calls and um, uh, it turns out most dispatchers are women. They're better at the kind of juggling aspect of it. You know, you're, it's kind of like being an air traffic controller. And um, uh, they say, you know, listen, we get calls and it's very frustrating because we know there are no resources available um and so they're kind of very interested in some of the calls they get being able to send somebody who has some resources and who has a more compassionate and appropriate response to the situation right um so it's a combination of 911 and, and non-emergency calls because honestly some people with the same situation some people call non-emergency some people call 911 um Eventually, we might want to expand it. There's a lot of hotlines in Oakland um, that are addressing different things. So, you know, I mean, theoretically, once we establish this and it's going well, then we can talk to the hotlines about, do you want to be able to connect people to the van, right? And how would we go about doing that? Um, so we can expand. Right now, the challenge is just making it happen. Um, and in terms of ongoing training, look, the point here is that this, uh, this program should be funded out of public safety. They're doing, a, they're doing public safety work by responding to you know, the calls that, that are currently responded to by police and fire. And so that funding should not only pay for salaries, but you know, it should pay for ongoing training. The police get ongoing training all the time. Um, and there's absolutely no reason that there shouldn't be ongoing training available if you're, you know, if you're, if you're under the public safety budget. And we're still going to say, 
the police get, they still get the training and they still have the exact same response to every call they go out on. If they're dealing with black and brown communities, if they're dealing with the homeless community, if they're dealing with the mental health community, it's a, it's a, it's harm. It's a harmful response. And we're trying to alleviate that. I also go out three times a week um, with the crew in North Oakland. And um, I have mapped out every homeless encampment, be it from one person to 30 people in North and West Oakland. And we go out on a food and hygiene drive. We bring out huge tanks, 100 and 250 gallon tanks of water. And uh, there's a couple of encampments where I see the police just circling or sitting over by West Oakland Bar Station, just looking, circling the one on MLK. And I, I, I've asked a number of the people there, um, how does that make you feel? Are they bothering you? And I said, it's very intimidating. It's very, we are already stressed enough. And now we've got the, if I get into an argument, just a, uh, people get into arguments. If I get into a nonviolent argument with someone, they come rushing over here. Why? Sometimes adults can handle things themselves and it doesn't involve a, a response by the police. So I have seen myself the way they interact with the, with the homeless encampments. And remember this too, uh, just yesterday, um, one of my Facebook uh, friends reported that OPD went out to the Wood Street encampment in West Oakland and just cleared everybody. Do you really think that they're storing all of their possessions? Where are the people supposed to go? So already the contact that they have, even if the police aren't staring, standing there watching them, sitting there watching them or circling around, they're the people that come out and remove their belongings. So it, it just, this is, this is, a, this is a, um, a recipe that is not working. There's got to be a better response. And we can, I think that we can do that. I know we can do that with macro. So I just wanted to. I, I want to say one. I, I, let me say one other thing too. So you know that. Um, well, I don't know who's responsible for this, um, but they are now saying that they're going to release a lot of prisoners from um, San Quentin because of the COVID um, uh, scare. Um, I'm sure that there's some people in in San Quentin who already have it. But where are those people going to go if there's no resources? Some of the people who are in San Quentin aren't from the Bay Area. So first of all, how are they gonna to get to their communities? And if they're here, where are they gonna stay? They're our next homeless population. The police are gonna be hassling them. They're gonna be on probation or parole. We don't know what their status is gonna be when they're released from prison. So that's another population that's gonna be impacted by the police department. Uh, thank you for that segue, um, Kathy, because um, the, the uh, formerly incarcerated people are way overrepresented in the unhoused community right now. Um, but um, San Quentin is actually a very interesting place. Um, San Quentin has some of the best programming for prisoners of any of the state in institutions. And um, so you talk to folks who have come out of San Quentin and they've done a lot of the kind of, uh, they've taken the classes, they've been counselors to their co-people, um, and then they come out of San Quentin and they work in reentry to help other people who are coming out into reentry, you know, to help reenter right. into society. So it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important group to remember that that's a lot of the people in our community, especially in the unhoused community, that we wanna be responding to. Um, it's a group that, um, in terms of being employed, is ignored in terms of what their skill set may be, right? So it's just a pool of potential people to hire that um, have an awful lot to offer. Um, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that there's not a barrier to employment um, for people who are formerly incarcerated. And we actually think it's probably an asset in terms of being able to, to really work with everybody in the community. Um, and uh, does the pilot, we do believe, um, Tini, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, does it, if it's going, if it reduces the number of calls that police have to take. So in Eugene, 
where they've been doing it for a long time and they do it for the entire city of Eugene, which of course is, you know, one fifth the size of Oakland, they respond years. to, the, for 30 years, they respond to about one in five emergency calls, right? So obviously over time, you don't need as many police when they are only responding to 80% of the calls. I actually think that over time, if you continue to look at it and you continue to ask the question about who you're gonna send out based on, does it require a badge and a gun? I think we can get beyond one in five, right? But first we've got to establish it. Um, so over time, does it reduce the police presence? Yes. And does it reduce police funding? Well, yeah, because you're now using part of the public safety budget to fund a response that's not a police response. Um, so I just wanted to say that if anybody wants to um, get, we have an email list that's kind of our macro email list and we just send out notices about what our next steps are and if we're doing community, you know, community uh, events. Um, and if you put your email in the, um, in, the, in the Zoom chat, I'm happy to add you to the macro list. We don't do too much spamming. And my understanding too, Anne and Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, is that this model that is from a, a, essentially a relatively small town in, in Eugene, that Oakland will be the first big city that this is. Yep. Understanding. Yeah. yep. It's uh, because, I mean, we just, you know, timing is, is a funny thing. Um, we've been looking at this for over a year. So this final report that came out is the culmination of a year's worth of discussion among community members, among service providers of the different services that are currently provided. Um, and it just so happened that we, we got to the final end of this and got to the proposal and are before the city council in this month of, you know, an international revolt on this very issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's why we're ahead. Now San Francisco is talking about it. I just got contacted by Contra Costa. Um, somebody's asking about, is there any way on mental health calls not to call the police? Initially, we just, the, the initial pilot, when you're, one of the things about starting something that's brand new is you want as few bells and whistles on it as possible, right? You want to just construct the simplest possible thing. And when you've got that figured out, then you can start to either put a second story on the house or add bells or whistles or however, you know, whatever analogy you want to use. So initially what we have in Oakland is we have 1,300 to 1,500 calls come in a day to OPD between the emergency and the non-emergency calls. And so the question is, what of those calls can we start to peel away just to diminish the police presence in the communities that really are uh, that have too much of a police presence and are having too many negative interactions with them, right? So initially, it's all going to be police calls. What happens over time in Eugene is that people get sophisticated about knowing that if they call the non-emergency line and they say, I want cahoots, I don't want the police, so long as they don't mention that somebody has a gun or some other thing that's going to kind of take the take the issue, you know, and, and make the dispatcher say, no, no, I've got to send police now. They know that they can, they can manipulate it to get, um, to get, to get the cahoots response. And I think that we'll probably get there or over time, once we've established our capacity to answer the easiest calls, then we're going to start looking at, well, what, well, what are we missing here? Right. Um, one of the things though, is that some mental health calls we have some programs in place where clinicians are answering mental health calls. There are problems because they're not 24 hours a day. Um, and it's like one car of clinicians. Um, but there, some people are getting a mental health response when they call. It's just like eight calls a day is the problem. And this leads me to, this leads right into Deborah's question, which is, would the public be able to call macro directly? Not now. I mean, for the initial pilot, we're just going to do it that one way, right? 
and um, we're going to do it as simply as possible. That in and of it, getting to a point where we're effectively responding to those calls is great. Once we've done that, we can figure out if we want to, you know, like then you go back to those communities and you say, are you really missing something? You know, what is your experience if you try calling um, the non-emergency line? One of the things that we know is that most people don't want a whole bunch of numbers, right? So is it easier just to get them to go through the non-emergency line? Um, we'll, we'll figure it out. First, we've got to figure out how to answer these 1,300 calls, and then we can move on to kind of, you know, some of the other aspects. One of the challenges, one of the challenges is if you're calling macro directly, then you have to have somebody who's sitting there answering the phones because the people who are in the van can't be answering the phone in the middle of dealing with, you know, they're in the middle of doing something. They can't be answering the phone. So then you're creating another mechanism, right, on top of the dispatch mechanism. And then logistically, now as the macro team, I'm being told to go somewhere by two different, right, places. So there's some stuff to work out. But what we know is we should start by taking some of the calls that we don't want police answering. And then, and that's not to say we would never consider another way of doing it, but we should first figure out the simple stuff before we add to it. Michael, do you want to ask your question? I know you've been waiting. Yes. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Ann. Um, Hi, Michael. One, one of your colleagues. Uh, it was recently announced that Alameda County is funding, and I think, uh, Ann, you alluded to it, a, uh, a mental health response that is out, outsourced partially to uh, a private am, ambulance, ambulance company that I, when I see there, the, the big FA, whatever, I, I think of it as FLAC, but... Uh, how will that effort, which is funded at least five times more than the pilot, the macro pilot, how will that interact with, with the macro operations? Thanks. Um, it's actually contracted as well with Bonita House, um, which is, I mean, they have a very long history of helping people in the community. But um, that program, um, it plans so a lot of a lot of the existing programs tend to answer very serious mental health calls right mm -hmm. so when you call and you say my son is off his meds right my adult son is off his meds and he needs to go back to the hospital to get stabilized we've been through it before we know exactly what needs to happen right it's this very serious mental health call and so that's kind of what some of the existing programs are, are intended to deal with. What they tend not to have the capacity to deal with just in terms of the number of calls they take is they can't really deal with the calls that may have some minor mental health component to them, or it's just by issue, by function of kind of being homeless or, or whatever else. So the, the newest one that they're starting, which um, there was some press on recently is called CATT, I forget what that stands for, but that is a clinician and an EMT. But what they've told us is they will mainly co-respond with police. So the problem with that is it may be perfectly appropriate for whatever calls they plan to take, but it means that you don't save any money because the police are still responding, right? And you don't get away from having a response that includes police. And one of the things from the community is when uh, people who are trying to help co-respond with the police, the police end up uh, uh, being the ones who drive the interaction, right? They, they don't step back and say, you know what? You seem like the better people to step forward. And you still have the situation where you have a person standing there with a uniform, a badge, and a gun. So. But there's plenty of work for everybody. You know, this is not, there's really no competition here because 1,500 calls a day, we could, everybody could double all of the money and number of people that they have out there and we, we would still not run out of calls. And Bruce had put into the chat and asked um, to be voiced for him about research about how many people call 911 versus how many people voluntarily call alternate numbers. 
Um, and also, there was a question about, is there already an alternate crisis number in Alameda County? Oh, there's four or five of them. All right, there's a 24-hour county line um, that's staffed by people who, it's, I think they largely focus on suicide, but um, they also, they'll, you know, if you just feel like talking to somebody, you can call them 24 hours a day. Um, and I mean, that, because it's 24 hours, honestly, if we were going to look at, at some point having a separate number, we would very likely start a conversation with them because they already have that mechanism in place, right? If we could just, you know, add to a pre-existing thing. So there's, yeah, there's a whole bunch. I think the frontline healers have a number. There's a lot of numbers out there. I'm not prepared and, to tell you what they all are. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I think the second part of his, his question was interrupting 911 might be the hard part. How do you actually get your number out there so that people have an alternative number to call? Mm -hmm. All of the people that we've spoken to who do any kind of program say you don't want additional numbers. that people don't want, you know, they just want to know the numbers that they can call. And if we can make it more functional to engage with, you know, with dispatch and we can make it where people know that if they call the non-emergency line and they ask for macro, then they'll get macro, then, um, you know, that might be a much easier, much easier hill to climb than educating the entire community to use a different number. Thank you, Deborah, for your comments in, in uh, chat. Um, I'd like to read them. I think uh, macro is a great start. Um, having a mobile presence in the community is so important. If healthcare for the homeless and access, capital A C C E S S, knew about it, plus police calls, you would be busy. 1 800 491 9099 will roll over to suicide prevention. Uh, mental health resources in Alameda County Monday through Friday. Yeah, the good thing about macro is it's going to be a 24-7 program, um, which is really going to be beneficial because sometimes I, I leave the flight deck um, early in the morning, um, sometime one o'clock in the morning, and there's a couple of people who like to howl in the middle of the night. They're howling to the moon. And I've seen the police come out and be, you know, rather mean to them. And if you could get macro out there to help them out a little bit and calm them down, that would be such a better answer uh, than OPD yeah. coming in and um, manhandling them. Mm -hmm. Kathy, I just wanted to share that, uh, that that's our mental health number. That 800 number is that one number in Alameda County for mental okay. health and also homeless and drug and alcohol services. But thanks, right. this, is, this is so exciting to hear as a mental health clinician and hitting those walls and those gates, um, you know, oftentimes, I mean, you, you just are so frustrated because it's very hard to get resources that do not, or to, to people that do not involve the police. Right, and um, right. and it, it's always traumatizing. So, appreciate yep. it. Should I add you to our mailing list? Yes. <laughs> Deborah's my neighbor, one of my neighbors. <laughs> Thanks, Put your Deborah. emails in the chat if you want to be added okay. to their mailing list. I and have Ibi, email. Ibi, I saw you have your uh, your hand up. Ibby, do you want to ask a question next? You're muted, Ibby. There Can you guys hear me? Yes, now. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's, it's not so much of a question. It's just uh, sort of, I just want to like, I guess, clarify some things like, mm -hmm. I've seen um, the police. We lost you for a second. We Ibi. lost Let's... you, Ibi. I think you're frozen. Sorry, let me see if I can. I think you have to turn off your video. There That's you what are. I have to do sometimes. There you are. I see you. Go ahead, Ibi. So, um, so I've seen a video um, of a white lady guy at a skate park. I'm not really sure what state it was in, but he was at a skate park and he was mad at the kids for whatever bizarre reason. Um, kids skating at a skate park. I'm not really sure what he could have seen was wrong, but mm -hmm. he uh, he got really upset with these kids and he pulled out a gun. 
mm-hmm. right? And started waving and threatening these kids. And mm-hmm. so, uh, so the cops showed up and the cops uh, were like, sir, you know, put the gun down. We're not able to talk to you. If you want to talk, that's fine, but you have to put the gun down and da 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 And they're literally de-escalating this situation. You know what I mean? And so I know that cops know about the idea of de-escalation. I mean, the problem comes in the fact that they don't care to de-escalate certain situations because they personally feel threatened in those situations. You know what I mean? So it's like, so even like, so the idea of, of training and stuff like that, like for me, like in name, like sounds like good, but I've also, but I also know that, that it's not necessarily about knowing what to do or not knowing what to do. You know what I mean? It's about um, feeling inspired or whatever to implement those things or to feel inspired to pull out your gun and, and murder someone. And so, you know, when it comes to uh, like uh, macro and stuff like that, I feel like in, in not only macro, but also just like accountability in general is that the police need to be accountable in every moment. You know, like people get called, the police call on them and they don't, they don't know if the person's mentally ill. You know what I mean? They just call and they feel threatened. And so they call the police. And so, and then the police come responding to the call that they got. They don't even know if the person who called them had their own mental uh, disorders. You know what I mean? And so these things aren't, aren't like these little cracks and things like that aren't necessarily addressed. And I think that when it comes to um, macro and what macro can do is really, um, and I, I'm not no expert obviously, but I feel like there has to be somebody there all the time, same way that the fire department shows up, same way that the ambulance shows up. In every single situation, there has to be someone who is, who is hopefully part of the, not hopefully, but definitely part of the community, a community leader who's there to watch to see what happens with a camera, a body cam that they can't turn off. You know what I mean? That they are responsible or whatever for, for looking at it in this objective sort of view and that and they don't have this brotherhood aspect with the police. You know what I mean? They are, they are the ones who are policing the police. They don't have weapons. They don't have tasers. They're literally there just to record the police and, and also report what it is that they saw from an from a, um, objective point of view. You know, and it's just like, there, there are so many, I've had guns pulled on me, whatever, uh, from, the, from the cops, just because I'm riding a bike at night with no, with no taillight. You know what I mean? Like, and so, and so am I riding with no taillight because I'm mentally ill? Like, is, you know what I mean? Like, it, there's too, there's not enough time, you know, in those moments, like cops make a split decision or whatever to pull out their gun and kill someone, you know what I mean? And so it's like, so for me, but I think macro is oh, like what I'm hearing about. It, I don't know much about it uh, admittedly, but I feel like there is, um, in order for people to feel comfortable or really to feel like they are like, like their tension is sort of um, dispelled with the police. If there's somebody else who was always, and that's something that you call if you think this is a non-emergency, you know what I mean? It's, it has to be something that in every single situation, there has to be somebody there. Because I mean, in, with a case with, uh, with uh, I think his name is Elijah McLean or whatever, like the police get called or whatever. And, and how could those people know to call, uh, who called the police on Elijah? How could they know he has a mental illness? How could they know what they're doing is they're feeling threatened. You know what I mean? And, and that's the way they call They call frantically. They're like, well, there's somebody, this is weird. I don't know what's going on today. And the cops start, and then there, it starts to build up this sort of like energy around it. And I feel like that, that there's nothing that we can really do to help that because I mean, there is something we can do, but that's a, that's a much longer time frame. You're know, like, like getting like uprooting racism in everybody's sort of like, you know, spirit, you know what I mean? So it's, mm-hmm. so I feel like, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to um, the police and accountability, like they're humans, you know what I mean? And, and in large part, they're white men, you know what I mean? And white men have been such a long time in brown bodies, you know what I mean? So it's like, so they, they, they need to be held account. They need to be policed, you know what I mean? As, as deeply as we're policed as well, you know what I mean? So it's just like, and I feel like in Their lives, their, our lives are in their hands. And so the same way a doctor has to go to all these years of school, not just a training session for six months, they had to go literally for like eight years, you know what I mean, of school to when they have someone's life in their hands or whatever, the police should not, should be, uh, should be uh, t- trained, I guess, like in, in, with that, that, like that intensely. And also, um, even when they are trained, because it's easy to, to, not easy, but it's, but it, it's, 
it's possible to, to read a textbook and regurgitate information. It's possible to be told about equality, told about injustices and regurgitate that information so you can become a cop and then you can go on and do the same thing. And you say like, well, I was trained, so like I did what I thought was the right thing to do. In the same way that doctors are, are held accountable for malpractice, all that kind of stuff, police have to, it has to be the same thing, you know? And so it's just like, I, like I, I appreciate the idea of macro coming in or whatever to be like this alternative, but, but I mean, the, the human aspect, the human error of all of it, you know what I mean? Like that's the part that we need to like address, I think, you know what I mean? Because they can, they, they humans make mistakes and, and without being too judgmental on why they're making these mistakes. You know, like they are bound to make the mistakes and if their gun is right there, the taser is right there and they feel threatened, it's not about them being a cop and about justice and about peace. It's about them protecting themselves and their brothers in arms, you know? And well, so anyway, yeah. You, you touched upon something there. Part of the problem is the police are never held accountable for their actions. So you can say whatever you want to. If the standard is, uh, I felt it was reasonable to shoot this person, Instead of, was it necessary? Was there something else you could have done? We need to change the standard, first of all. And then second of all, officers need to be held accountable. Now you see in the George Floyd case and now in the Breonna case, months after these, these uh, innocent people were killed, now the officers are being arrested and charged. There needs to be um, consequences. If you kill someone and they're running away from you, that's murder. The person is running away from you. There's no threat to you. Why are you shooting them in the back? And then we don't prosecute that person. Right. That's unreason. That's that's what's unreasonable. And so I think um, if we can get the standard change, and I think that was it changed in in California or it's on it's. Um, we're working on use of force with with the with the the police uh, commission is working on use of force policy. Um, there's got to be a radical change in what happens to police officers when they kill someone when it was completely unnecessary to do so. So and until be, I mean, they're not held accountable, these, these murders are gonna continue. That's part of the problem. Be, I wanna clarify one thing in terms of training and what we were talking about. I, I don't, I'm not actually, a lot of people have been saying we have to train police more and I'm more on your page where um, it turns out that when police uh, go through a training on um, implicit bias, they, after the training, they do better when they're taking a test on implicit bias. It doesn't actually affect their behavior out on the streets, but they do better on a test, okay? So um, training people who don't wanna be trained has a limited, has has limited value and i'm really done with oh we're going to train the police i think we would get a lot further if the police who um were standing around when a police officer does something were convinced that they were going to get in trouble too if they didn't tell the truth right I'm, i mean i years ago there was a video of um a police officer just beating some man and they didn't know that there was a camera you know, there's a security camera nearby, but it's, the, I'm fascinated by the five guys standing around watching it, right? Because if they believe that they were gonna get in trouble, then suddenly they might be a whole lot less interested in lying for him, right? Um, but, but the training in and of itself with police, we've tried training them, that's not what works. It's time for a hammer, right? Where they just understand that if you do things, it's gonna be a problem. Um, this macro doesn't remove all of the police from all of the situations, right? It doesn't solve every problem. It solves one problem, which is police responding to calls that they're not well equipped to handle. They don't know what the resources are. They don't like handling those calls. I, the number of police officers that mm -hmm. you hear say, I'm not a social worker, you know? So that's the thing. Now, in terms of the training that we were talking about earlier for the macro team, you do want people to be well-trained, but hopefully, I mean, the idea is you're hiring people who want to do this work, right? And when you're training people to make sure that they have all of the um, information and the practice that they need to do their work well, then that tends to work, right? Because that's training that they want and they find meaningful and they find helpful in terms of their ability to respond effectively 
to the call. So that, let's just distinguish between training police where they're ordered to go to training and then they do better on the test, but they don't take it out into the street with them. And the training that we were talking about, which was for the macro team. I agree with you that there are ongoing problems, you know, with police. And the mm -hmm. thing is, that's the problem with police not coming from communities is that no matter how good your intentions are, how much your bias is implicit and not explicit, you're engaging with people that you don't understand and you don't really share a language with, you don't share a culture with, you don't share an understanding with. And of course, therefore, you, you don't understand when they're being threatening, right? Because you don't, you, they're not your people, right? And so the, all we're trying to do here is to begin to replace police with somebody who, you know, comes from the same community and understands kind of what's going on and we'll move from there, right? Good answer, yeah. Ann. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one thing that I really, the main, because I feel like I was rambling a little bit when I, when I was talking, but I think the main thing about, about macro that I really want to stick in there is that there should always be somebody there, like always be somebody watching the police, not like the police show up for this and the macro shows up for that. You know what I mean? It's like, because those two things, like both situations can be a little weird because even if macro was called in situations that they thought was non-violent or non-emergency and they ended up getting caught up in a situation that was actually a lot worse than they thought, you know what I mean? Then in that case, you would want them to, to, to carry like some sort of weapon to protect themselves or whatever, you know what I mean? And so, um, and so I guess my sticking point is just that there should always be somebody there who maybe has a, has pepper spray in case things get like kind of like hairy or whatever, you know what I mean? But but is there mainly to watch the police as an outside observer, you know what I mean? And, and, is, and is reports to uh, something higher than the chief of police or whatever, you know what I mean? How, like someone who, they, where their word and what they say is actually taken, taken seriously. I mean, we're just like, okay, this is what this person says. We trust them same way we trust the president or we trust the senator to make cert certain decisions. That when those people say like, hey, that, that cop and these cops are whatever fucked up, you know what I mean? That there is an immediate response, and these and it's not our word against theirs or did it or any of that kind of stuff. But it's someone who actually has an understanding of something besides brutality or whatever to to make these decisions. Besides, you know, so that's so that was like my um, my main thing, and I hope that with that because the main thing is like the macro and the police. It seems like it's, it's going to be two completely different departments. You know what I mean? It'd be like. One would be like, you know, local level, the other one would be state or federal level, you know what I mean? And so it's just like, and, and those oftentimes, as we've seen with many laws, whatever, don't necessarily coincide well, you know? And so I feel like, uh, so I feel like they, they it, it's, it should just be another tier, you know what I mean? And, and like another uh, sort of umbrella that everything kind of goes under, which is humanity, which is, which is you know, justice, you know, real actual justice and not just the maintaining of peace for those who who see peace a certain way. You know what I mean? Some people see like homeless people as like a problem. You know what I mean? And so their peace gets maintained by the police fucking with homeless people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like and that's and that's the reason why the police are doing this whole thing. Because that the idea of a homeless person is like this disruption. It's a it's a public disturbance according to rich people. But according to people like you and me and this person, that person, people actually who live out here, homeless people are unfortunate uh like uh aspect of history you know what mm -hmm. i mean it's just, uh, it's it's like it, they they are victims you know but to other people they're a nuisance and so i think that those people who think that they're a nuisance shouldn't be the ones making all the decisions and, and the cops should not be mm -hmm. you know in their pockets you know where a person can drive drunk in a ferrari and crash into a house or whatever and nobody's their the morality is not put into question but somebody who's sleeping you know what i mean on the street is now considered some sort of vagrant You know, or like it's causing some kind of problem or something. You know what I mean? um, but I've already spoken way too much, so I'm just going to. So that leads that. me to um, Pegasus Giraffe's uh, question: Was do the field workers and mental health responders carry any form of protection, like pepper spray or something non-forceful? How would they deal with situations that turn violent or become dangerous? So, um, what they do in Eugene. Um, and we've actually started to have conversations with some of the folks that do outreach in Oakland. Um, but what they do in Eugene is that they, uh, 
they, uh, I think they may carry pepper spray for dogs. I, I have to check with them, but um, uh, they, look, here's the thing. There are already people in our communities who are doing very, very similar work, except they're not responding to 911 calls, but they're going into the same communities and they're doing it completely unarmed and they're using their basic intelligence and understanding of the community to know what's safe, right? So one of the things that's important is that macro teams have to have complete autonomy to decide whether they're going to respond to a call, right? And the CAHOOTS people tell a very interesting story about pulling up. They had the call. They were told the call had to do with a man who was alone in his house and that he hadn't been out in several days, right? Well, they pull up and there's two cars in the driveway and one of the cars is still warm. And something about it bothered them. And they said, no, we're not taking this call, right? They didn't have to explain why, right? They're in charge of their own safety first. But they also know things like, I mean, number one, um, if somebody doesn't want to deal with them, they don't deal with them. Now that person may go on to have another situation that creates, a, you know, that creates another problem because there's a reason that macro was called in the first place, but everybody knows they don't have to interact, right? And, and that makes you feel more confident in interacting with them to start with. Second of all, sometimes you don't go into a person's area. You ask them to come to you to talk. Um, they, leave, they have the van pointed out so that they can leave quickly. I mean, they know a series of things to do, as do all of the outreach workers and mental health workers and everybody else who goes out into the community every day, right? You, you, you figure out how to do things. In Eugene, out, they do like 28,000 calls a year, and they call the police to a scene about 150 times a year, right? The vast majority of the time, yeah, something is different than you thought it was going to be, but that's okay. They, they manage it. You know, the fact is that most people are not looking to harm somebody who is clearly listening to them and is responsive to them and is, you know, respecting them, right? And it, it generally works out. Great. Okay. We have just a few uh, minutes left. Um, so I was wondering if we could take maybe one more burning question. Bruce has a question. Uh, have CAHOOTS people been injured frequently? In 30 years, no CAHOOTS worker has ever gone to uh, the hospital with an injury. Right. I mean, they're all over the city. They've stepped on rakes and, you know, other fairly minor stuff, but there's never been a serious injury in 30 years. Wow. Great. So okay. they're doing better than the cops. Mm -hmm. Great. Kathy and Anne, do you have, I'm, I'm going to begin our wrap up and I want to really thank, thank the two of you for this really powerful discussion. I really feel like, um, you know, this exploration of alternative methods is super important and, and harm reduction, continuing to explore different ways that uh, we, can, we can nip these situations in the bud is, uh, it's huge. Um, so I wanna thank you and I wanna thank everyone who's on the call right now that have been, you know, just the participation in this program tonight. Kathy and Anne, do you have any final things you wanna say before we close out? I'd like to thank everyone for attending this call. And uh, if you want to learn more about um, macro, um, we've got a link in the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, Joshua can repost it. And we'd love if you would donate to our organization um, or become a member and learn more about the work that we do. We're doing a lot of work in Oakland. It's all around policy work. It's all about changing how the Oakland Police Department responds to its citizens. They consume about over 50% of our budget. And what we're getting from them is a lot of brutality. There are some good cops out there. I admit that. I know that.
But if you've got a thousand good cops and 10 bad ones, if the 1,000 aren't reporting the 10 bad ones, make your own conclusions there. So let's really continue this work about um, making the police department accountable to its citizens who pay them. They're not bringing their wages back to Oakland. They're taking them out to their community. And we really deserve to have a department that's responsive to our needs. And um, thank you all. Thanks. Um, I would, I mean, I would say uh, if you are running across the mayor or the city councilors, um, please tell them that you support macro because, you know, they voted on it this time, but they need to know that people are really watching the program and, and want it to have the resources and the support that it needs to, to thrive. Um, so please communicate that. If you're interested, get, get in touch with us. Um, there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of different things to support the rollout right now um, and the whole implementation process. Um, and uh, yeah, just keep an, keep an eye on that. And then in terms of the police accountability, Ibby, we are working on that through CPA. We're working on police accountability. We really are trying. But, you know, and, oh, come and on over to our, our website L. and join us. Tell them about our Measure LL cleanups right quickly. Yeah, there will be something on the November ballot that'll be um, an effort to strengthen the police commission's role. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, look for that on the, on the November ballot and look for more information on it. Great, thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for everyone who's participated tonight. Thank um, you. I have, I, I often close these out by leaving kind of a, a thought question prompt uh, and my, my question this evening, and you, which you can explore however you like. Some people explore it just by hanging out and talking about it. Some people explore it through writing or music or, and then sometimes they send us their explorations and we get to continue the conversation that way. Um, my question tonight, this is sort of just like for myself and I offer it out here to everyone else, which is how might you practice unconditional positive regard and when was a moment that you have received or felt unconditional positive regard from somebody else? So that's just kind of out there. You can take that with you. I'm gonna be thinking that about that a lot. I've been thinking about the notion of unconditional positive regard for myself and then how that radiates out to other people who I see in my neighborhood every day and just who I engage with. Um, so thanks to Kathy, another Kathy and Anne, another big round of applause to y'all. Thank you to Joshua and Sango uh, for helping out this evening and supporting the program. And um, thanks for all of you for participating. Uh, one last plug, which is, um, so we have a bunch of links on there where you can continue to engage with uh, uh, CPA, the Coalition for Police Accountability. You can get involved with ma macro. You can, you can be on the email list and continue to hear um, how that program is going and other activity uh, with that organization. Also, I want to plug Theater Bay Area uh, website where you can find information about free webinars called The Changing Face of Theater, Creating During COVID. So this program that we're doing right now was, was originally started um, you know, in a, as a response to COVID. Um, and there is also the Performing Artists Worker Relief Fund that we want to just kind of let folks know about to um, either contribute to or to access if you are in fact a performing artist. Um, tonight concludes 12 weeks of this pilot program. We're talking about pilot programs this evening. Um, this has been a 12 week journey and uh, I, you know, when, when I first started it, you know, with our, And weeks of media, what to do, how how it would shape or transform me and or others, and um, I just really uh, am thankful to have gotten the opportunity to to try it out, to engage in these conversations, and and share insight and and consult the experts and the 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 change makers that are that are all around us. Um, so I, you know. Kathy, I, I've known you for, for quite some time. It's a blessing to have you on the show. Um, and I'm just getting to know you now and, I, and it, it feels uh, 
so nourishing to hear the, the, the work that the, the two of you are doing. And I feel like that's what this program has been about to just kind of find out what are the beautiful transformative things that are happening and being tried right now at this time. Um, and let's keep, let's keep connecting on, on that because, because we need that. So um, thanks for joining us. We're gonna be taking a break for the month of July, assessing the program and reflecting on it, on what we've learned from this medium. Um, and then we'll be getting to ready, ready to launch another season uh, of this program and different iterations of how this might continue forward. So, so stay in touch um, and, uh, and uh, may each of you be well and healthy. And I hope to see you again in August. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Lisa. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Sam. See my neighbors here. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy and Anne, very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Deborah, Thanks, Jake, Ibby, Rich, Linda, Pegasus, Devorit. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon in the neighborhood. Yeah. Kathy, Bye. Bye. When Anne, Amy was talking about unconditional positive regard, I thought of you. Oh my God! Thank you, Lisa. There you go. Lisa's my wonderful longtime friend from college. I love her. Positive regard and support. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great program. Very. Thank you. Good all right. You all. Thank Good you night, so everyone. Go enjoy what's left of the sun. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. I'm gonna save this chat.